going to be wrapping up the series that I've been preaching on, you know, Christian cults, so-called Christian cults. And um, there's others out there. I kind of wanted to hit the big ones, so that's why I got the Mormons and the Jehovah's Witness and Seventh-day Adventist. And there's, it, those are not, by any means, the only ones. But if you remember, you know, we went over a lot of the characteristics of a cult, and all three of those have a lot in common. They all originated around the same time. They all had leaders that they looked to as getting special words from God. And, and they, they have their own special writings and prophecy, you know, and, and words from God that's outside of the Bible. There's a lot of different characteristics that we use. And, you know, when we use the word cult, there's a, people mean all kinds of different things when you say it. And it's not even a word that has a really good, solid definition. So the first sermon I preached, I kind of went over a lot of the different characteristics that I was using to define a cult. And, um, you know, people have a tendency to throw that word around really flippantly. Now, the, the organization that I'm going to be preaching about this morning, they're not exactly the same. I don't believe they're necessarily a full-blown cult, but they're very cult-ish. And it's something that's very, that, that's close to our area and, our, and, and where we live, and they have a big influence on this area, which is why I want to bring this up and kind of bring this to light. And I hear about it, literally, I mean, really, really, really frequently. I'm hearing stories all the time because we go out soul winning every week. And I'm talking to people on a weekly basis. And the church I'm talking about is the Potter's House that's up here in Prescott, Arizona. And if you're not familiar with the Potter's House, they have other affiliate churches that, that Essentially, it's the same group, though. So they, in, I know in Phoenix, they've got a church called The Door. Same thing. The Door, the Potter's House, it's all the same organization. Uh, CFM is their Christian Fellowship Ministries. It's kind of the organization that, that groups everyone together. And then they also have um, Victory Chapel is another part of their organization or denomination. Now, um, we're starting off here in 2 Timothy chapter 2 because... Like every other sermon, it's important to get the spirit in which we're, I'm preaching this and, and, and why we're going into this. And the point isn't just to say, we're better than all these people. Ha ha, look at them. They're cults. We're not a cult. You know, and have this kind of silly mentality that unfortunately some people have. And some people want to, to boast and, and, and have pride in their wisdom and knowledge and all these other people are stupid. That's not the point of this at all. Not, not even close. Look down at the end here of 2 Timothy chapter 2. We're read in verse number 24. This is very good admonition unto a preacher unto Timothy from the Apostle Paul. Verse number 24 says, And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. People who are involved in a cult are taken captive. They're in the snare of the devil. They've gotten sucked into something that usually they wholeheartedly believe, but they've been deceived. They're snared and they need to come out of that. We love the people that go to these cults and these churches and we want them to get saved. This is the spirit and the attitude with which I'm preaching these sermons because we're trying to reach them. Now, there are those that are the false prophets and that are total enemies and wolves in sheep's clothing, and those typically are the ones in leadership. And, and even then, not always. We have to remember, remember the Apostle Paul was a Pharisee. Remember that he was persecuting the church of God. Remember that he was very active against the things of God, yet he did so ignorantly. He was not a wolf in sheep's clothing. He was not somebody who was a, a reprobate, you know, child of Satan that was just out to destroy, you know, the things of God. Even though by his actions he was fighting against God. He did so ignorantly in unbelief. So there are those that are out there that are like the Apostle Paul. So we don't want to just cast them away as being reprobate, but try to reach them and try to get through to them to the best of our ability. And, and you know, we believe in the reprobate doctrine and people who are rejected. And we know that there are false prophets out there, but we don't want to, again, throw that around really loosely either and just start, you know, blaming, you know, calling everybody, oh, these are just a bunch of reprobates and all this other stuff. We give people the benefit of the doubt 
I mean, we, and we should almost to a fault. We ought, we ought to just, when you're giving the gospel, just, just preach the gospel to people no matter what. You know, when I talk to a pastor at a door, a lot of times I'm thinking like, oh, great. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, like, here we go. And it's because oftentimes they won't convert. They won't change. But you can't have the attitude that they never will. I mean, that's the whole reason we're there. God's word is powerful anyway. Yo, God's word is going to be the one that's going to cut through the dividing of the soul and, the son, you know, the soul and spirit, and, and it will get through to their heart if they're willing to listen to God's word. And that's what we, uh, that's what we, we strive to do here. So it's important to see you know, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, these people are taken captive by, you know, are in the snare of Satan, and they're taken captive by will. And we need to, with meekness, not with pride, not with arrogancy, go and tell everyone why they're so wrong and why we're right. When you meekly approach somebody, you, 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 you present God's word, you can do so boldly without being arrogant. You can boldly open up your mouth and preach the word of God without just, just coming off as, as talking down to people and, and saying, you know so much and they don't know anything and how can you be so stupid, right? That is not the attitude we want to have when we're preaching the gospel, people. We are supposed to go with meekness and humility and just instruct them, yes, but instructing how they oppose themselves. Because really, you know, it's not, they're not against me, they're against God, they're against themselves. And we just need to show them the errors of their ways. So th this is the spirit with which we're doing this. And if anybody, you know, if any Potter's House people end up coming across this video, which they probably will, because we've got, it's funny, I preached a sermon just last year about the false gospel that the Potter's House preaches. And I called them out by name because they're actually active in our community. They go out and they do outreach and they have concerts and they have all these different things to, to bring people in. And it's very important to, to just let people know, hey, this is what they actually believe. This is what they teach. And it's false. It's not right. It's a false gospel. And they also, another thing, another reason for doing this is that they have a lot of beliefs that can look very similar to us. So they'll preach against worldliness. They'll, they'll, you know, they'll, they'll have certain types of sermons that are like hard preaching maybe. And they have some standards of living that we might subscribe to as well. And I don't want people to get a false impression of like, oh, you're just like the Potter's House because we're nothing like the Potter's House. Yeah, they may, they may not watch television or go to movies. Great, we don't do that. You know, we, I don't teach that either. I, I teach the same, uh, you know, same thing. But we are so far removed from each other and, and really it comes down to the gospel. I and mean, they're a Pentecostal church. But they're... Um, and, and that's why I hesitate to just call them a cult with the definition I've been using as cult because there's a lot of different denominations. And you can argue that all these different denominations are cults and you could base it on doctrine. And that's fine. I don't have a problem with that. But the way that I've been defining cult has not been that way. But here's some, I'm going to get into some of the cultish behavior and the things that, that makes me not so uh, hesitant to call them a cult. And it's just mostly been through my experience of people I talk to at the door and all of the stories that I hear about how they get people in and try to keep you in and then scare the congregation to death, literally, by, by holding hell over their head. Because they believe that if you backside, you're going to hell. If you don't pay your tithe, you're going to hell. If you, do, you, know, if you go to another church, you're going to hell. If you, you know, various things that, that are really keeping their congregation in fear of leaving, in fear of doing anything contrary. And that's because they don't have the assurance of the true gospel of Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ paid for our sins once for all. And that is paid for. So they're constantly just saying, you know, you, you know we, it's funny, we even got um, um, one of our church members was it your friend that got the postcard in the mail, come back, backslider? Like, the lady what? Who lived at our okay, yo, so someone, someone lived in the apartment of, of one of our church members and, uh, and previously must have had some type of interaction with the Potter's House and they had her mailing address and things like that. And they sent her a postcard just saying, like, come back, backslider. Okay. Like, what? <laughs> it's kind of comical, but it's like, this is, the way, this is what they're getting there. Like, you're just backslidden. You have to get back here. You're, you're going to hell. And that's what they're teaching. And that's what's keeping people in a lot of these churches. And it's really doing a lot of damage because oftentimes I'll confront people at the door and try to preach the gospel to them. 
and they've been so ruined by the potter's house saying, I'm never going to any church again. Now, obviously that's wrong. You can't judge every church based on your one experience. Unfortunately, though, a lot of people do that. You have one really bad experience in a really bad church, and they say, you know what? I've been down that road, and I want to have nothing to do with it because they promised me all this goodness and salvation and everything else, and it was the exact opposite, and, and they've, you know, they've ruined my life or they've shunned me or whatever. I've heard all these various stories. And look, I don't typically just, if I hear one or two people complaining about a church, just automatically assume that that church is horrible because every church is going to have some people that get upset some people that you know may not even just like the word of god a lot of the things when i was kind of looking up and getting different testimonies from people on the internet about about the church here a lot of it was just i think they were right about what the word of god teaches and people just didn't want to hear that so that criticism, you, know, you got to be careful with just what, what other people are saying. But there gets a point where you keep hearing the same thing over and over and over and over again, and you hear the same stories from people. That's not just about their doctrine, but the way that people are treated and, and the way that things operate there. That makes me not ashamed to put them in this list of these churches I'm, that I'm saying are Christian cults. There's been enough of that to say, you know, there, there's way too much of this out there to say that this is, this, this, there's no truth to this. So uh, just a little bit of a history on the church. Wayman Mitchell is the founder. He started off, you know, in the 70s in a four-square church before basically starting his own brand of, of Pentecostalism, which is, uh, I, I don't think it's that far removed necessarily, but there was some issues that he had. Came out of the four-square church and... Um, They've been located here in Prescott. This is, this is where all the churches come from. So this is like the hub. The main hub is in Prescott, Arizona. And he's been here for, you know, over 30 years. 30 or 40 years or something like that. I mean, the man, the man himself that started is old. He's, I think he's in his 80s. I don't, I don't know his exact age, but he's, he's getting up there in years. And he's been doing this for a really long time. And they have churches literally all over the world. I mean, they, they've got it in, in various different countries as well as in the United States. And um, there's been rumors, and, and this is just that, so before, because I'm going to get into more concrete, you know, evidence and things from scripture and stuff like that, but rumors of, of locking people in services or in other events, you know, they hold these haunted houses and kind of get people, you know, they, they lure people in. And it's usually, they, it's funny because they, they preach against worldliness, but then they lure people in using everything worldly, you know, I mean, the haunted houses, rock concerts, things like that, just to get people in and then just to get them captive and have your captive audience to then try to, to slam the gospel down their throat, which is a false gospel anyways. And I mean, I, just a few weeks ago, I talked to someone who said, yeah, my buddy went to one of their churches. He said they started speaking in tongues and he got, you know, he got all freaked out and wanted to leave with his family. And the guy at the door was like, no, you can't leave. It's disrespectful to leave during the service right now. And he said the guy, his friend was like a karate instructor or something, and he broke his arm like, no, we're leaving, and got out. And that's just one story and one example of, of people that I hear things like this over and over again. So if it was just one thing, I wouldn't even repeat it. But you hear these testimonies over and over and over again from people who they have no reason to, you know, as they're having a personal conversation with me to just, to just lie about this. There's no motive to just to, to come up with these stories. And when you compare all of them in accumulation and you see the, the similarities between them, you know, something's got to be going on there. Um, some of the cultish behaviors, they, they oftentimes are, are com completely shutting off all communication with family members, which is very typical of cults to do, to just not have anything to do with your family, have, you know, just, just completely remove them from your life. Now, obviously, there, there may be some times where you might need to do that, but those are going to be extreme situations. It's not going to be something that's going to be normally happening within a church. At least I don't think so. I mean, you could have unsaved family members that you still could be in communication with and be right with God and everything's fine. You know, I mean, the, the, having a, a strong family is important and being able to reach your family. Obviously, there may be situations where you do have to cut ties. 
but the, the amount of times where that happens, it should not be the norm by any stretch. And there's tons of people claiming that, you know, their children, their parents, their brothers or sisters have nothing to do with them simply because they're not in the church. And that's like the only reason, which is ridiculous. Uh, anyone outside of their church, they teach is, you know, either if they are saved, they're just a lukewarm Christian or they're of Satan, literally of the devil. And they don't want to hear anything you have to say because it's already been programmed in them that, you know, any opposing views, anything coming from someone who used to be a member of their church, that's of the devil. They're a backslider and they're just trying to, to taint your heart so they won't listen to that. And again, it's very cultish. You know, you ought to be able to. I have no problems if someone who came out of a fundamental Baptist church wants to tell me why the fundamental Baptists are wrong. I'll have a conversation with you. We could talk about it, right? Because if we're going to rely on Scripture, then who cares? But when you have people trying to warn them, hey, look, you're part of a cult. Hey, look at this organization. You know, come and tell me why you think we're a cult. I'm not afraid to talk to you. I'm not going to just, just shun you and not have anything to do with it. I'll have the conversation. And you ought to be able to be open to that no matter where you're at because otherwise you may be in a cult. <laughs> if you can't even talk to someone about why you're wrong or about why they think you're wrong, be careful about that. They, um, let's see, they, oh yeah, I already mentioned this, they use the deceptive practices to draw people in. And I see their handouts, if you're not from this area, maybe you haven't seen them before, but basically they'll have, they'll have these events and it literally says nothing about their church on it. Nothing at all. And it'll be like, free concert at this place or that place, you know, at this square or wherever it is. We're having this free concert and you have free tacos. And they just pass this out, and the guys are dressed, you know, I mean, just dressed down, like just looking normal, just handing them out at the park or wherever. I mean, we were in, in line, and my kids were getting swim lessons, and, you know, there's someone there just passing them out. And, and it looks, I'm like, because I've seen them so many times, I go, yep, this is Potter House. I, re I already know it because their style is the same. But you would never know, unless you know them, that that is what it really is. And, I mean, this particular one was in kind of a poor area of town. And what's amazing to me is that they lure people in with their, their free stuff and their free concert. And then they usually pass an offering plate around at these. But, you know, it's like you're going to the poor areas and then you're, you're like asking them for money, you know. And that drives me nuts because you really get, when, you, when you're giving stuff away for free and then you're asking for like money, you're totally guilting people into just, just giving you more money. And, and when you go to people who don't have much to begin with, I mean, that's just, that's messed up. But they, they, they use these deceptive practices. And like I mentioned, they preach against worldliness as we, as we also do. I'm going to read a few verses for you just about that subject. In 1 Corinthians 2.12, the Bible says, Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. We have the spirit from God, not of this world. Right? And it's very clear, the teaching of not being worldly, not being like this world. James 4, 4, ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. We're not to be worldly. This is good teaching. James 1, 27, pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fathers and, world and, and widow, excuse me, widows in their affliction and keep himself unspotted from the world. The world is always in a negative light. It's not, you know, we're supposed to go into the world. Jesus Christ came into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. We're supposed to preach the gospel to the world, but we're not supposed to be of the world. We're not supposed to be like part of the world and have worldly influences in our lives. We go to them, bring the light, bring the gospel, but not to be like them or, or associated with the world in general. 1 John 2.15, the Bible says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world, if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Now, the reason why I'm bringing this up and pointing this out is because of their hypocrisy in claiming to be against worldliness. And this is one of the reasons why they shun people and have nothing to do with their families and stuff. And, but at the same time, they're using rock concerts to draw people in. And they're using deceptive methods, not telling you what the real thing is that you're, you want to do there, and just trying to draw them in and lure people in without just being upfront about it. I mean, I thought Christianity and what Christ represents is just being open, 
being out front. When did you ever see Jesus Christ just trying to tempt people and lure them in with their physical lusts to then, oh, now we could teach to them? No, you see the exact, he didn't lure people in with the free bread. He actually, when people came to him after he fed the multitudes, after he fed the 5,000 and they came seeking bread, he's like, why are you coming here? You're just coming to seek bread. And was like, going to just cast them away for just coming to seek the bread. What he did when he fed the multitudes, he was already preaching to them. He already was telling them why he was there and what he's doing and giving them good news. And the people that came wanted to hear him. They had no idea they were getting a free lunch. And then he had compassion on them because they were sitting there listening for a while. And then he feeds them. Great. That's how Jesus operates. He doesn't put up signs saying, hey, we're having free food today. Come get your free food and not mention anything that it's a church or there's any religious thing aspect to it. It's just this free event in the park. Oh, and then we're going to hit you with, with what we want to hit you with now. That's not the way anybody, any Christian app writes in the Bible. But they're deceptive. They have their, their club in downtown Prescott. It's called 180 Degrees. And it literally looks like a nightclub. And again, if you didn't know anything about it, you drive past, the sign, it's, it's real wor worldly design, fancy, 180 degrees, and it's got the little arrows going both ways and stuff. And um, black, I think it's black sign, and it just it looks like a nightclub. And they advertise concerts. They have concerts going on all the time. In fact, I, I, I went to the website and said on Saturday, September 30th at 8 p.m., they're having Crossfire, all of the above, and Dopeless Hope Fiends. Those are the bands. And, they, and, they, and then they put next to it, Crossfire, 80s rock. All of the above, indie rock. Dopeless Hope Fiends, blues. Talk about worldly. Yeah. I mean, okay, yeah, they're going to insert Jesus into their lyrics. And that's, you know, oh, we're going to bring these people in and we're going to give them good godly music. And everything is patterned after the world. Yet they're against worldliness. Go figure that out. I don't know. I don't see how our worship of the Lord should be patterned after the world, after all those verses I just referenced of not being in the world, not loving the world, not having anything to do with the world. More cultish behavior. I already mentioned this. Backsliders go to hell is what they literally teach. And that, you know, they're big proponents of being able to lose your salvation. Of course, they could never define at what point you lose your salvation. Because most of them will admit, yeah, I sin probably every day when I, when I bring it up. Oh, but you're not going to hell, but they are. They just make up their rules as they go, as anyone who believes you can lose your salvation does. Uh, they also use the same fear tactics when it comes to tithing. Now, I was not able to confirm this within any church material because they don't really publish a lot. And even a lot of their, like there's, there's some sermons online, but not very many. It's not like they post everything up online because I was really, I really have done my best. With all of the other cults, I can, it's easy to find the stuff just published, even from their own organizations. I was able to find a lot from Adventist.org, from the, you know, Mormon.org, from, from these websites that literally are like a, a affiliated or associated with the church and not as much with this. But from former pastors' testimony that were a part of this organization, that came out of this organization, they described a pyramid church structure, or denomination structure, where um, every church plant, and they're real big on church plants, but every church plant, 5% of what they take in goes to the church that started that one specifically, and then 5% five five goes to the mother, the mother church which is right here in Prescott. Now, again, I wasn't able to verify that within their organization, but from what I perceive to be solid witnesses of people who are part of that, that that's, that's how it operates. And there's a lot of, of complaints from people about where the money actually goes that they're giving in because they push, they push giving, 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 tithing. It's money, 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 money. I listened to six sermons while in, over the course of the past month or whatever trying to prepare and get and, and like I said, I, I want to be honest in the representation of these churches and not just spew off a bunch of lies and hearsay and I go to the source. And in the six sermons I listened to, five of them brought up tithing and giving. Five out of six. 
Tells you a little bit about where their heart is. And these are the names of the sermons I listened to. 2017, Summer Prescott Bible Conference, Wayman Mitchell, Monday night. 2017, so these are new. Winter Prescott Bible Conference, Wayman Mitchell, Monday night. 2016, Summer Prescott Bible Conference, Wayman Mitchell, Friday night. Pioneer Rally, 2014, Pastor Wayman Mitchell, a must-see. Every single one of those sermons brings up, bringing up how you need to tithe. Bringing up tithing. Now look, we believe in tithing. It's a biblical doctrine. But do you know how often tithing is mentioned in the Bible, especially like just the New Testament practice of? Not very much. Even in just in the whole Bible in general, it's not mentioned very much. It's there. We preach on it, but it's not something that we're going to be hammering down every week on or every big event. Now, all of these sermons were big events. So I'm thinking, well, that's definitely their MO when they have these big conferences and stuff. Yeah, they're You've got a lot of people there, so now they're really going to be talking about getting that money to come in because there's a lot of people at once. But even some of the other ones, I, I, it, was, it was more of a minor point in the sermon, and they usually are. It's not the focal point of the sermon, but they keep on throwing it out there. There's a sermon called The God of Justice from January 24th, 2017, where they mentioned money, you know, giving and stuff like that a couple times. So it's this, it's this continual... And that's how they kind of brainwash your people, too. When you just keep on getting the same thing thrown at you, even if it's not the main subject, but just in every, if every sermon I talk about how you need to give, just threw it into my sermon every single time, that's what's going to stick. And, and the reason why they're doing it is because false prophets are known for being greedy. Turn, if you would, to, um, turn if you would to 1 Timothy chapter 3. I'm going to read for you from 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2 talks a lot about false prophets. 2 Peter chapter 2 verse number 1, the Bible says, But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness, Shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not? The context here, like it says in verse number one, is false prophets. And through covetousness, because they're greedy, because they want more, they make merchandise of the people. They're making merchandise of you. They're going to be continually talking about giving and getting the money and putting the money in the offering plate, and you're not right with God, and God's going to send you to hell if you don't pay. See, the... What the Bible represents when it comes to giving has way more to do with blessings being given to your account and, and it being a good thing and God pouring out blessings on you for doing what's right as opposed to you're being sent to hell if you don't give this money. It's two different percent, you know, uh, ways to portray the doctrine and, and the way that the Bible points it out is not the same as the way that they portray it. But um, so, uh, Titus chapter 1, verse number 10, I'll read this for you. You're in 1 Timothy chapter 3. You're in 1 Timothy chapter 3. Titus 1.10 says, For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they have the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things what they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. And when they're teaching things that they ought not, they're teaching people that you're going to hell for every little reason. And, that, this is the, and it's the same thing the Catholic Church did with their indulgences. They want people just to stay scared and to be fearful of going to hell. And they think, well, if I give my money, I'll be okay. If I, get, you know, if I just keep coming to church, I'll be okay. And just holding that fear over them and thinking that this is how they're going to do it. And they teach things that they ought not for filthy lucre's sake because they know the money is going to keep rolling in. Because that's ultimately what I believe that they're all about. They're ultimately about the money. They're try, they're, they grow their church. They use the rock concerts. They get people in to just collect more money. Verse 12, one of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said, the Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. This witness is true. Wherefore, rebuke them sharply. Now, what's interesting about this, and the reason why I continue to go in Titus 1, it's talking about these, these preachers that teach things that they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. And then it says, a prophet of their own, or this is what they're saying. The Cretans, they're always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies, and how they're talking down about the Cretans. And they're just giving a false report, a bad report about these people and having this attitude of we're better than them, which 
from the witness testimonies that I get from the people I go there, that is the same exact spirit and attitude that's being taught there as well. You're in 1 Timothy chapter 3. Look at verse number 2. We're going to see, because this, this gives us how a pastor ought to be. This is how God de defines someone who, who holds the office of a bishop and how they ought to, uh, their characteristics ought to be. Verse number 2, a bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre. It's very important that, that one of the, the qualifications for being a bishop is to not be greedy of filthy lucre. Lucre is just money. Not being greedy of money. Why? Because you are administering the tithes and the offerings. You are in a position where there is money. Your money is being handled. You can't be greedy of getting money in your own personal gain if you're supposed to be watching over the flock and watching over the whole church and preaching the truth from God's word. Because sometimes preaching the truth of God's word is going to get people to leave. It's going to make people not want to give much money in the offering plate, but that should not be your motivation. You cannot care about that at all. You have to be able to just preach the truth no matter what and not be greedy of that filthy lucre. Uh, 1 Peter chapter number 5 is another example. You can turn there. 1 Peter chapter number 5. Another example from the Bible of how, how a pastor ought to lead, how a pastor ought to rule the church. Verse number 1, 1 Peter chapter 5, The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder. So he's speaking to the elders, as an elder to a group of elders, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. Again, we see that mission. Now, it's not for money. You don't do this for money. But look at verse number three. Neither is being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. And this is another spirit that we have of the potter's house as being lords over the church and lording over the people and telling them what they, you know, how they need to live, every single aspect of their life, you know, being a lord over them and not necessarily as being examples, right? If I'm going to preach or teach anything to you, I better be a good example of that. And it ought to be coming from scripture and not just my own opinion and not just what I think. You know, when we teach against worldliness, that applies to everything. You know, when I pre if I'm going to preach that you shouldn't be watching TV or go to movies and stuff like that, it's going to be because it's a biblical principle, not just because of anything else. And we, we have to apply it consistently to everything. And I have to be living the same example that I'm going to be teaching and preaching to everyone else. And, that's, and, it's, and it's not lording over and saying, you can't do these things in our church. I'm going to teach what the Bible says, and it's up to you to decide what you do. And we're not checking up on you, making sure, are you doing this, are you doing that? Do what you want to do. You know, that's between you and God. My job is to preach God's word. Now, especially in a small church, there may be things that, that, that may become a pattern that I, that I might notice or preach on, but it's not ruling over anybody. If I see things that I think might be out of line with Scripture in general in the church, I'll preach on it. But you know what? You're welcome back. Every, even if you don't change or do anything different that, that maybe I might think would be a good idea to, to do, keep coming back. I mean, unless, unless you're, you're committing some sin, like in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, that talks about breaking fellowship with people. We're not, we're not lording over you. I'm not going to go to anyone individually and say, hey, you have, I saw that you have this DVD at your house and you need to get rid of that. I'm not going to do that. If I do, say something to me about that if that ever happens because I don't ever want to go down that path of just lording over what you do in your life because that's not what, a, what, a, what an elder is supposed to do. And, um, but this is the type of attitude from all the comments I've heard, from the, from the testimonies I've heard that people go to church that that is the, the, the way that it is over there. The Bible says that the love of money is the root of all evil in 1 Timothy chapter 6. 
But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Turn, if you would, to James chapter 2. James chapter 2. And that's why it's so important, again, for an elder or a bishop not to be given to money, not to be someone who's doing it or in it for money. Because the love of money is the root of all evil. And if you start making compromises with God's word just to get more money to come in, I mean, you're, you're going you're, you're to be full of, um, you're going to be pierced through with many sorrows. And that is the root of all evil. And that will not be the only thing that, that you end up getting into. That's just the beginning point of getting into all kinds of other sin and wickedness. The last point I'm going to cover, because it, because it is the most important point when it comes to this, is their false gospel. And I already preached a whole sermon about this, so it's, you know, I'm not going to go into everything I, I preached in that other sermon. But it is the most important thing. And, and when we have churches that are actively going out and teaching a false gospel, they need to be called out. They need to be marked right. and avoided and, and, and let people know, hey, this is what they teach there. It's a big organization. They reach a lot of people. They have a lot of influence. And people need to know what they're about and what they teach. Now, just like the other cults, the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons, they love James chapter 2 also. Let's read in James chapter 2 the part that they, that they would like to, you know, base their salvation on. Verse number 19, the Bible says, Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble, but wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Ye see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. This is the passage that Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, anyone who wants to teach a works-based salvation is going to want to turn to to try to throw off your belief if it's you know, in just faith alone, that you just have to believe on Jesus Christ in order to be saved. Now, when it comes to any doctrine, I just want to bring this up, any doctrine that you believe, if you have 500 or 1,000 verses that all say the same thing very, very clearly, like, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. You know, um, all of these verses, for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. And you have over and over and over again throughout the Bible these verses that don't mention anything about works and it's all about faith and it's all belief and you have a mountain of evidence all saying that this is what you have to do to be saved and then you have one verse, one passage that says, oh, that's kind of weird. Well, that's not what everything else says. If, that's, if that happens, your understanding of that one verse is wrong. If you think it's contradicting everything else in the Bible, your understanding of that passage is wrong. And that's why when they come to you and say, oh, see, it's not just by faith. It has to be works also in order to be saved, in order to receive eternal life. That's false because it's not what this passage is teaching at all. When you read the whole chapter, it's talking about being justified in the eyes of man versus being justified in the eyes of God, which Romans chapter 4, which is something that you ought to compare because it's brought up here in James chapter 2, how Rome in Romans chapter 4 brings up Abraham, just like James chapter 2 brings up Abraham. Romans chapter 4 says, What shall we say then that Abraham our father is pertaining the flesh hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. If Abraham was justified by his works, he can boast about that. He could glory about that. He could brag about that because it's something that he did. The Bible is saying, but not before God. 
He's not justified before. You can be justified before man by your works. People do it all the time. People think, wow, that's a really good person. That person must be going, you know, they're really godly. They're really good because they see the works that you do. And that's how people can see your goodness is through your works, which is what James 2 is, is saying. You know, it starts off saying, hey, if someone comes to you and they're naked and they're hungry, if you don't give them food and clothing, if you just say, hey, be warm, be filled, God bless you, and you don't actually do anything for them, it doesn't help them out at all. That's what the chapter is talking about. He said, no, you know, you need to, to, to help that person out. But it's not you need to help that person out in order for you to go to heaven. Right. It's to be a benefit unto them. They're not benefited by it. No one else is benefited by your faith if you have no works. It's doing good to others is going to help them out. The works that you do is to help other people out. It's not to help out your own soul and get you saved. It's to be, it's to be a benefit to other people. Romans 4 says that if Abraham were justified by his works, he hath word of glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, and this is important, but him that worketh not. What does that mean? Someone who's not doing any works, but believeth. So is it possible to believe and not work? You better believe it is, otherwise this statement couldn't even be in the Bible. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that is justified, that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. There is faith without works right there of someone being saved. Amen. So when we see in James chapter 2, you notice it says, Ye say then, how by works a man is justified and not by faith only? How is a man justified by, by works and not by faith only? In the eyes of man. That's how. Not in the eyes of God. In the eyes of men, that is how someone is justified by, by works and not faith only. If people want to turn to James 2, what I like to do is just jump up a little bit further in the passage. Because in James 2, verse number 10, the Bible says, For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. For he that said, do not commit adultery, said also do not kill. Now, if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. And you could show people that, you know, oh, you have to turn from all of your sins in order to be saved. Unless they're teaching sinless perfection, right? Which, again, you could destroy that by just going over sins in the Bible, saying, you know, you cannot live a perfect life. You could go to 1 John. You could show people that, you know, in 1 John chapter 1, that if you, you know, if you say that you have no sin, you deceive yourself. You know, truth is not in you. And that's very easy to show people. Look, and most people, there's not that many people that believe in a sinless perfection. Because that's just completely bizarre. And, and you have to be so lifted up with pride to think that you don't sin and have so little knowledge of God's law to think that you don't sin you know, that, that those people are pretty far gone. But for the most people you talk to, they'll say, oh yeah, I sin. Well, James 2.10, if you keep the whole law and you offend at one point, you're guilty of all. So good luck using your works to help save you. Saying, I repented of all my sins because you didn't. You didn't repent of all of your sins. Nobody has. You might like to think that you do because, oh, I don't want to sin. But you still do it. Sorry, if you, if you still do something, you haven't completely turned from it. Whether you want to do it or not, you still haven't completely turned from it. So if you go to Galatians chapter 3, it's the last place I'll have you turn. Galatians chapter number 3. Galatians chapter 3. Talk about a book that's really clear on the gospel. You've got Romans and you've got Galatians. Galatians is awesome. You're trying to show someone the truth of just being saved by faith and not of works. Uh, if you're in chapter 3, you could just look at chapter 2, verse 16. The Bible says, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Notice the difference. There's works and then there's faith. It's being two separate things. You're not justified by the works. You are justified by the faith. Oh, but you, if you don't have faith, you, you don't have works and your faith is dead. Yeah. It's separating the two. Your justification comes from faith, not from your works. 
If you have works, you show your faith. And notice in James 2, it doesn't say, oh, if you stop having works, then you're going to go to hell. It says your faith is dead. Who believe? I believe that statement. If you have faith without works, your faith is dead. Amen. Amen. That's what the Bible says. It does not say your eternal life becomes temporary life. It does not say you are damned forever because, oh, you don't have works. Show me that in the Bible. It's not found. No only man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Or but see, people like this, they all, they'll say, oh, we believe it's by salvation by grace through faith. Works salvation crowd always say that. Oh, how, how could you say we believe in works? We believe it's faith alone. We do, oh, it's just faith. But if you backslide, you're going to hell. How is that not works? Galatians chapter 3. Look at verse number 1. This is written to the church of Galatia. It's getting really screwed up on their, on their salvation doctrine. Look at verse number 1. O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? that ye should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you. This only would I learn of you. Received ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are ye so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are ye now made perfect by the flesh? This is a great passage to show people who say, oh, well, you need to be saved by grace through faith in order to get saved. But then to stay saved, you got to do the works and everything else. Well, wait, are you now made perfect by the law? You received the Spirit through faith, and now you're made perfect by the law? Who's bewitched you? What are you thinking? No, faith is what cleansed you. Your works never could do that, and they can never do that before, during, or after you put your faith in Jesus Christ. It doesn't do it. Verse 3, are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? Have you suffered so many things in vain, if it be yet in vain? He therefore that ministereth to you the Spirit, and worketh miracles among you, doeth he it by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith? Even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. So we have Romans 4 and Galatians chapter 3, both referring to Abraham believing God. And then you have James chapter 2 explaining that, well, he believed God, and then he was going to offer up his son as a sacrifice, and that perfected his faith. Sure it did. But it doesn't mean that he wasn't saved up until, uh, all the way up until the point he was ready to sacrifice his son at, you know, 100 and whatever years old. When his son was, you know, 13 or whatever, he's going to, to, to gather the wood and, you know, and do all that. He was saved well before that because he believed God. He believed God that God was going to give him a seed. He believed God. And that's not even when I believe he got saved anyways. It wasn't with the promise of him having a son. The faith in God's word was perfected when he followed through because it, sh it demonstrated outwardly that he really does believe that. But he really believed that before any of those works ever came out. The faith was genuine at the beginning. It was made evident at the end outwardly. That's not when he got saved with the works. The faith saved him. If we have faith and it's genuine, you know, we're going to believe that Jesus Christ is, is the Son of God. You know when that faith could become evident? If you were to be confronted with God and God said, why should I let you into heaven? Because Jesus Christ. Because he paid for my sins. Just answering that, all of a sudden your faith becomes evident. It's, it's manifest out loud. Let's keep reading here in Galatians uh, 3. Let's jump down to verse number 10. The Bible says, For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone, cursed is everyone, that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. And this is, you know, the, the Bible is written in language. You, you, there is no wiggle room. It's not, well, unless you're trying to do what's right. No, if you don't continue in all things which are written in the law, there's a curse on you. All things. That means everything. That means if you sin every day, you're cursed. That curse is on you. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident, for the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith. 
Obeying God's law, that is not faith. That's obeying God's law. That's work. But the man that doeth them shall live in them. Verse number 13. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. This is why we have salvation. Because we don't live in every single work of the law. We don't follow the law completely. So we have a curse. But Jesus became the curse for us and removed the curse from us. It, a child can understand this. God designed it that way so that everybody can understand it, so that all could be saved. Because God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. All people, God want, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. God wants everyone to be saved. But he left it up to us. Jesus Christ became the curse. He held the curse so that we don't have to be cursed. And you're either cursed or you're not. You don't go back and forth between the two. Either he paid for every single sin on the tree or he did not. Jump down to verse number 16 here, Galatians 3. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not unto seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. This is a really, really important point to understanding salvation. Because in Galatians 3, I know we skipped a few verses, but this is still talking about Abraham receiving promises. Now, what came first, Abraham or Moses? Who came first? Abraham was first. Abraham was given promises. Abraham was given salvation. The Bible says that the gospel was preached unto Abraham. The law that we know, God's law, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, that was given through Moses. That was given after Abraham. So how could committing a sin or a transgression based on the law given in the first five books of the Bible, he's saying that doesn't disannul the promise that was made to Abraham. That doesn't change that. So if we receive the promise that Abraham received, because this chapter we'll get to in a minute, explains that we can receive those promises because those promises are through Christ because it wasn't just to Abraham. It was to Abraham and his seed, which is Christ. Right. We receive that promise through Christ. And the law doesn't disannul that. So when you break the law, it doesn't change that promise that was made. That promise is unbroken. We receive the promise and the law can't change that. Let's keep reading because this, this chapter is awesome for this, this concept. Verse 18, for if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more a promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. And again, this is the difference. It's, it's, it's putting a dichotomy between there's the law and then you have a promise. If someone makes you a promise, you have to believe that they're going to fulfill their end of the deal, right? They're saying, my word is true. You believe this. I'm telling this. I'm making you this promise. You've got nothing to show for it other than you just have to believe that. Versus the law well, the law is very simple. Do this or don't do this. You get punished. You, know, I mean, you, you break the law. There, there's there's a, a system of just being punished or not being punished. See, the law doesn't give anything. The law tells you what not to do. That's it. The law only meets out punishment and judgment. But the law doesn't bless you or give you any free gifts. You know, nobody is getting a free gift just because there's an Arizona state law. I mean, the law is not giving you. Now, the law may steal from some people and, give it and, and, and dis, you know, distribute money around, but the law itself isn't, isn't doing anything good other than just, basically, it's, the law would be, well, if you don't pay your taxes for the, so that this person can receive them, then we're going to punish you. That's what the law does. But the promise is of faith. So this is what they're, they're, look at verse number 19. The Bible says, wherefore then serveth the law. So then why do we even have a law? It was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made and was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Now a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. Is the law then against the promises of God? So is the law against the promises? 
God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up under the faith, which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. So the law is given. It's not in contradiction to the promise of God, but the law is given because of transgressions to show us, hey, you guys are sinners and you're not good enough for heaven and you need a savior. That's why the law is given. And we, before, faith, before you have faith in Christ, you are shut up and kept under the law. You're under the curse of the law because no one, you don't have uh, Christ that has paid that penalty for you until your faith is put in him. So you're kept under the law. You're shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. The law is our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. The law is there literally to show us you're not as good as you think you are. That's why the law is there. Because otherwise we'd all think we're great and everything's just fine. And, oh, yeah, I screwed up here and screwed up there, but I'm, I'm still good. No, with the law, you're guilty. With the law, there's a punishment that needs to be paid. So that schoolmaster then should lead us to say, I need a Savior. And that's what Christ is, that we might be justified by faith. But then it says in verse 25, but after that faith has come, so after you're saved, after you put your faith in Christ, we're no longer under a schoolmaster. We're no longer under the law or under the curse of the law. Verse number 26, for ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. There is no more, you know, there is no more curse of the law once your faith is in Christ because Christ became that curse for you. And it's very simple to understand. And this is what the Bible is teaching from, from front to back. And unfortunately, there's a lot of people that pervert the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is what's prompting my whole series on, these, on the cults, on the people who are, who are using fear, manipulation, intimidation. They're, they're deceitfully using the word of God, trying, trying to deceive people, either whether it be to give them money or, or whatever the, the actual cause is behind what they're doing, or even if it's just through ignorance. It's still not true. And look at, turn, flip back to chapter 1. Chapter 1, this was what was uh, you know, originally in the beginning of, of the Apostle Paul's letter to the church of Galatia, why this is so serious and important and how we treat and deal with people that are preaching a false gospel. Now, we want to reach the people, yes. We want, to, we want to humbly and meekly show them their error, show them Galatians 3, show them how they're wrong about James 2, show them in Jonah chapter 2, you know, chapter 3, verse, how, how they're, uh, verse 10, how their um, they're repenting of sin and turning from their evil ways works. Show them that definition about, show them where they're wrong and humbly entreat them. But at the same time, if, if someone's coming to you with a, with a false gospel, this is how we treat it and how we deal with it and how, how important this is. Galatians 1 lays this out. Look at verse number 6. The Bible says, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we are an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that you have received, let him be accursed. There is a curse on people who are preaching a false gospel. And we should not be afraid to use these verses and to show these verses and say, hey, you're preaching a false gospel and you're to be accursed. Because only the gospel of faith is going to remove the curse of the law anyways. You're accursed. And what happened here in Galatia, he says, you know, I marvel you're so, so removed unto another gospel. And then he explains further, he says, it's not just a completely different gospel. It's not like you've just gone into some other religion altogether. It's a perversion of the actual gospel of Jesus Christ. So they're still using Jesus, they're still using all this stuff, but then they're adding something to it. They've perverted it. They've changed it. They, they've made it false by adding lies which is what the potter's house and any other church that preaches that you can lose your salvation, that you have to do works to keep it, is doing. They perverted the gospel of Christ. 
it's funny, when I first preached a sermon last, last year, when I started getting comments about it, I, I, I brought up a story, an illustration of, because that's what prompted me to, to, to preach the sermon, is that you know, every once in a while they come around and they advertise big events and they're having special preachers in town or whatever, they're healing conferences and stuff like that. So I, when people come to my door, I try to give them the gospel first. And if they just don't want to hear it, then I, then I reject it. But I was talking to this kid. So I had this, this experience with, this, with, with a teenager. And I relayed that story in my previous sermon. Then people are coming, oh, you're basing everything on just what some teenager said. No, I'm not basing everything I believe in, in my experience off of one teenager and one interaction. I have interaction with Potter's House people all the time. And you know what? They're all the same. It's all consistent. And anyone who goes soul winning in this church can testify to that fact that you pretty much have the same type of spirit, the same type of pride and arrogance among almost every single person that you run into about how spiritual they are and how great they are and how you're going to hell without even knowing what you believe and then teaching that if you backslide, you can lose your salvation. They all believe that. They all believe that. I mean, it was confirmed to me again and again and again just recently. I was having a conversation again with a younger kid. And you say, oh, but that's not what the church teaches. Then why does everyone believe this? My, other, my, my one example, the kid was saying, you got to get saved every day because you, if you sin every day, you got to get saved every day. And this, this other example, I talked to another youth that goes to that church saying, you have to earn your salvation. He literally said, I said you have to earn, yes, you have to earn your salvation. You have to work for it. He literally said that. Yet they make fun of me because, you know, everyone wants to bring up the example of Hitler. Well, what if Hitler believed? You know what? If Hitler believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and he's saved because that's what the Bible says. You can make fun of that all you want. You could, you could, you could cast our name as evil all you want. But what you're doing is you're, you're putting the scripture on its head. You're not believing what God's word literally says that if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you're saved. Now that's it. Amen. Done. And every experience I have with anyone that goes to that church is always the same. So you could, you know, people could try to tear apart any one example. It's not one example. I go soul winning every single week, twice a week. I run into a lot of people. I talk to a lot of people. And Potter's House is a big church, so I run into a lot of people that go to Potter's House. And it's the same story virtually every single time. False gospel. Pride, arrogancy. But you know what? We ought not to combat their pride and arrogancy with pride and arrogancy. It's not going to work. Let them be proud. Doesn't matter. Hopefully God will humble them. We meekly show them what God's word says. Look, if they don't accept it, one and two admonition, reject. That's fine. Keep moving on. But we don't need to get into a battle of who's more righteous and who's more spiritual or anything like that or who knows the Bible more. No. Just, just show them, hey, did you, did you, you know, know what the Bible says this? You know, you know what the Bible says if you, if you commit, you know, if you break the law in one point, you're guilty of all? In all. That's a lot. The Bible doesn't say anywhere you have to ask for forgiveness every single day or else you're not saved. That's what they believe. So hopefully we get these people, you know, the, again, the point is to reach these people. You're all in this church. I'm not worried about you going to some other church, but we need to know what they believe, what their texts are, what they do, and to warn other people, because sometimes people get these flyers and stuff and they have no idea what it is. And just be like, hey, you know, that, that's, a, you know that's a church doing that and, and this is what they're all about. Go look up what they're all about before you join and, and become a part of that organization. Because it's pretty scary, the stories, some of the stories I've heard. I mean, even, um, I, don't, did I, I didn't even bring up the story of your dad, right? One of the church members here, her dad, had a, a confrontation with them where they, they were having, some, they, they lured him in with, um, under false pretenses with some worldly things, you know, with booze or whatever, some party that's going on. They tried to get him to go to this party. And he was in a wheelchair at the time. And I guess he, they, they brought him down the stairwell and, and kind of left him in this one landing part where they're trying to give them their spiel then and, and try to get him saved or whatever they're trying to do. He didn't want anything to do with it and they left him there. 
in the wheelchair in this in this landing on the stairwell. He couldn't go couldn't go anywhere and had to wait for someone else to come help him. Whoever get you know I don't know who came and helped him ultimately, but like when he didn't want to hear him, it was just see him, you know. And that's it's one example, right? Again, it's it's one example. You say, oh, it's just one or two people. Yeah, you know what? It's one example. It may just be one or two people in the church, but I've heard these examples over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. You can't tell me it's just the same one or two people that are just doing, wreaking havoc of bringing their name down about the things that they do at the church. And anyone who lives in this area could probably have a story for you along the same lines. But um, let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for uh, the truth for the, the truth of the, the gospel, for the promises that you made to us, dear Lord, and that you are a God that keeps his, his word, keeps his promises. And Lord, we know that when you say it's eternal life, that we can trust you, that it, that it lasts forever. We have no doubts in our minds that you've given us a gift that we haven't earned, we don't deserve it, and that it lasts forever. Lord, we thank you for that gift. We thank you that you've made it so easy on us to get saved. I pray that you please help us to know our Bibles, to, know, to, to, to walk in the Spirit, dear Lord, to be filled with the Holy Ghost and to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to this dark world. Help us, Lord. Lead us. Direct us. Lead us when we go out soul winning this afternoon. Help us to get many people saved, Lord. Help us to reach the people of the potter's house. Help us to reach the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons and the people that are in, ensnared by the devil. Lord, help us to reach them and to illuminate them and show them what your word says. God, we, we want these people to be saved, and we ask that you would please use us to do it. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.